are going to uh, carry on through with the book of James, and we've been doing that together. So uh, today is no different. I don't have a specific outline that we're going to follow through this week. As I looked through this text, I thought uh, it would be best, and my heart just wanted to just kind of walk through it uh, step by step and kind of look and point at the flowers and the trees and different things as we walk through the text. So that's what we'll do together without a specific outline uh, because he's really dealing with one subject, and it is the subject of patience. Now, you might think that the subject of patience really it seems out of the blue uh, from what we've been looking at. If you remember the text and the context and all that we've looked at before, why suddenly is he talking about patience? You might remember, in fact, that last week's section, uh, verses 1 to 6, he was talking uh, specifically to the rich, those people who were stepping on the little ones beneath them, who were taking advantage of those who had no way, no recourse, no way to respond to them. They were abusing the poor. And they were, um, James was laying out for them, as I mentioned last week, a woe. They, are being, they were being warned by James. This is what's coming to you unless you turn around. And he was condemning them for persecution against those who were uh, poorer than them. So from condemning the persecutors, he now goes to comforting the persecuted. And that's what this transition is. It seems almost random, but just so you understand the book, he now goes to the subject of patience because those people are under the struggle and the strife of those who are abusing them because of their wealthy positions and power. And so James now tells them to be patient. Be patient, therefore, brothers. You notice he has the word brothers in there because he's talking to the church and to God's people. And again, this morning, just to remind you that this word is for all of us. Although James wrote it in the first century, this, of course, is for all believers. Be patient. What do you think of when you think of the word patient? We often think of things that just require us to kind of hold our breath. They'll just hang in there for a few more minutes. Just, just a little bit longer, maybe I can get on with this. Be patient with your brother, we teach our children. You try to be patient with your spouse because while well, you're sitting in the car and they're ready to go and they're still doing whatever they're doing because you have no clue why it takes so long just to leave the house. Patience. Sometimes we think of patience when we're sitting in traffic, when you're standing in line at the bank or whatever opportunity you have to stand in the line and you have to exercise Patience. Can I just say politely, that's really not the patience that James is talking about. That's what comes to our minds. Certainly that's a tip of the iceberg. Certainly that's an excellent aspect of patience that we need to exercise. Certainly that is a good thing to live into our, build into our lives, into our existence. But I'm not talking about you learning to politely twiddle your thumbs while the doctor's uh, running late and looking at the third patient when you were here uh, on time and he's now you're 45 minutes late and whatever's going on and you need to exercise some patience. Sure. That's good. That's an excellent characteristic to uh, hold to. But that's not what he's talking about. It is a far, far bigger picture. It is a far grander scale that he's calling us to. It is not just patience to hang on for a few more minutes so then you can finally get what you were waiting for and have your own way. He says, be patient, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. That is a very long wait. In fact, we don't know what that wait looks like. But what he is saying ultimately is to hang in there in the ultimate sense that though there are things in our lives as the context would have from what's been previous in the passage, although our lives are sometimes confusing, although we don't know why things happen, although the, why the people in power over us have wielded their power and now our, our employer is doing what to our job? and where cutbacks are coming, and why is this happening to me, and what is going on, and I don't understand it, and I was overlooked, and this isn't right, and that's not fair, and all that is taking place. Sometimes injustice happens to us. So sometimes the scales of justice just don't tip properly. Sometimes they don't go your way. Sometimes it's just you coming out of the parking lot and realizing that somebody has driven away that they've done that dastardly deed of allowing that shopping cart to bang into your, your uh, Ferrari or whatever it is that you drive. I usually drive a Ferrari. And <laughs> you now come out into the parking lot and you realize there's no note. There's no evidence. What, how, what have they done to my vehicle? I want justice. There's no witnesses. There's nothing you can do except drive away and deal with it. Maybe it's something more serious. Maybe you have been, to use a word, 
burgled. I think I told you uh, some time ago that the only one time I was burgled, one of my favorite words in the English language, it's a real word by the way in case you think I'm making that up, I was burgled. I like to use that word so I'm saying it several times. I was a teenager, lived in Toronto, came home one day and discovered things were a little bit amiss and things weren't right and something was wrong and couldn't work it out and I came into my bedroom and I realized that my piggy bank was missing. Now I'm sure you want to chuggle at the word piggy bank, but oh no, this was a piggy bank with a, it was a really fat pig that seriously had some hard cash inside that thing and when I found that missing, boy, I was absolutely ticked as a teenager. We called the police, the police came and dusted for fingerprints and found my fingerprints all over my bedroom, surprise. Nothing was ever done or could be done. To this day, I have no idea who burgled me. It's a real word. And I'm annoyed. Injustice. I'm going to tell you a story that really is beyond belief at times even when I tell it. One time we um, had an ordinary day, tucked our children into bed. We were living on the other side of the province and in the middle of the night about 3 a.m. we heard this cacophony of noise. Absolute unbelievable sound that I literally thought was the second coming. I woke up from a dead sleep. I had no idea what was going on. It was a sound I could not identify. It was about 12 seconds long. It sounded like clangling chains and breaking metal and shattering glass and busting something and it just kept going and grinding and just what is that? And it was in the house. We ran outside to just in time to see a truck disappearing behind their neighbor's bushes at about 100K. And we looked over to the right and we could not believe this sight. A truck had hit our house. What? You could see the tracks of where he left the road and the neighbor's lawn and the next neighbor's lawn all the way to our house. The police said that based on what they could do with all the math and the slide rule and whatever they do, he was going about 100 kilometers an hour and if he had actually hit the house, he would have entered the house and he would have killed our son. But by God's grace, for whatever reason, this drunk driver at the last second saw our house, swerved, drove across the front, sheared the back end of his tailgate off of his pickup truck. Did I mention that this guy was a barn painter? He so happened to have in the back of his truck a load of every kind of color of paint that you could imagine. When he hit the house, the paint cans jettisoned, burst open and painted our house in a myriad of colors. Went all over the lawn, there was paint everywhere, there was ladders, there was tools, there was clothes, there was chains, there was everything that every barn painter would ever need for everything. It was on our lawn, strewn across, covered in paint, the windows dripping, everything was unbelievable and we're looking at what? was no trouble to find out who did it because all we literally did was follow the trickle of paint down the driveway and down the road and around the corner and right to his driveway. And by the time the police arrived, it turned out that the guy got home, he phoned the police and said that his truck had been stolen and returned to his driveway. Now I don't know how you would feel knowing that you literally almost lost a child as the police unfolded the story, that they've ruined your home, which you know is not the end of the world because it's just a home and you, we had insurance and blah, 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 blah. But I still want justice. Do you know how much that guy paid? Zero. Do you know how much time he spent in jail? Zero. Do you know how much anybody cared? Zero. Do you know what was done about it? Zero. Do you know what the police did? Zero. Do you know what anybody did? Zero. Do you know we had neighbors coming by, taking pictures and talking like we were, you know, we're going to show up in the National Enquirer like we were the great freak show of the towns. Look what happened. Da, 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 da. We hear voices outside. There's a whole group of strangers on our front lawn snapping pictures and posing and doing all this kind of... What, what is this? We became an entertaining thing, but absolutely nothing was ever done. To this day, I don't know who did it. Can I just try to tell you something? There is injustice that you will experience in this life that you have, have experienced that will make no sense to you. That will never connect the dots. 
You may never see justice. You may never understand why somebody got an illness in your family. You may never understand why that child was taken or whatever horrific thing you've had to go through. You may never put the pieces together. There are things that go on that are straight up injustice. We live in a fallen world. We are subject to all kind of nonsense. We are subject to other people's stupidity. We sometimes have to take it on the chin. Nothing can be done about it. Nothing is done about it. They walk away scot-free. You have to pick up the pieces. It is injustice. What does the Bible say is our response when we face that kind of injustice? Well, can I just remind you what Deuteronomy 23 says? Verse 35, vengeance is mine. This is the Lord speaking. And recompense for the time when their foot shall slip. For the day of their calamity is at hand. And their doom comes swiftly. That's God's response to how we should respond. What is it? God knows who did it. And God promises that one day when their foot finally slips, vengeance is mine. You just stand back and let me bring justice to this situation. We've seen this over and over again in the New Testament. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. Now, according to Deuteronomy, I will repay, says the Lord. Again, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30, for we know him who said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. What happens when you fall, find justice? Do we pick up arms? Do we make a big stink? Do you know what the Bible tells us to do and what our response is? Leave it to God. This is why he says, Brothers, be patient until the coming of the Lord. We're not talking about you getting along and waiting in line and being patient enough to hang in there until your turn comes at the grocery store. We're not talking about that kind of patience. We are talking about the kind of patience that wants to see justice, that knows that there is inequity, iniquity in this world, that knows that there is inequality in your own life, that knows that you have been wronged. Oh, brothers, be patient. Be patient and hang in there because there is a judge, the judge, the great judge, who knows all, who sees all, who will finally, once and for all, make all things right. Be patient for the coming of the Lord. He uses this little illustration. If um, you know anything about farming, I know very little. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. Now, just to explain a little bit of the topography and this part of the world and understand why he would borrow a, an illustration from farming. I'm not a farmer. You know that. I mentioned that several times in every opportunity I get because I embarrass myself talking about farming. Um, we grew up in a far uh, my children grew up in a farming environment and we would be driving along in the car and one of my children would say, oh, look at the combine. I don't know what a combine is. It's when you take two things and you put them together, combine them. I don't know what a combine is. So I'm looking around like a fool. What's a combine? Where is the combine? I have no idea. They know everything about farming. What's my point? Now I have to tell you about farming and I have no clue what I'm talking about. Early and late rains. The early rains for, that James would have been referring to come in October, November. That sounds late to us, but their uh, planting season is completely reversed from us. The October, November rains, the early rains come and now soften up the earth that the Mediterranean sun has baked hard and now the earth is ready to be plowed and ready to be planted. And they plant their seeds. Why do they plant them now? Because the rains have come. Do they now go in the next day and wake up and say, there's the corn? You know that's not how it works. You have to wait and wait and wait until what? You are not dependent on the rains that have to come. And there are some rains that smatter through the winter season and into the early spring. And then come the late rains, James says. The late rains finally show up and they come in April and May. And this is the final deluge of rain that brings the finished product to fruition. James is just using them as an illustration to point out the fact that we, like farmers, need to wait it out patiently. We don't see the fruit of justice right away. Now, the patient farmer doesn't just plant his field and then go in and do nothing. First of all, he has to deal with the headache of getting the finances and go to the bank and see what he can borrow and all the rest if he needs to do that. 
Then if there's a lack of rain, he has to try and deal with that, and he keeps trying to get his crops growing in spite of the fact that there's now insects coming in, and he has to deal with that, and he gets his pesticides and herbicides and whatever's going on, and then he realizes that the birds are coming in, so then he has to set up scarecrows or, or booming things or whatever they shoot off with that propane uh, guns or whatever they're doing that don't work anyways. And then they have to worry about the coons and the, the groundhogs, and they have to get out their, their guns and whatever, and there's nothing coming up yet, but they're working the land, they're working the land, they don't see any fruit, they don't see anything, and what are they doing? They're pressing on. They're working in spite of the fact that they don't see it yet, they don't see it yet, the rain is from God, I can't bring the rain, they can't bring the rain, they're waiting for the rain, they're trusting that God has said that one day they would bear fruit if they just were patient. And that's all he's saying. And one day, eventually, the farmer comes in at the end of the season and he actually has everything that he worked for. He didn't see it. He wavered for it. There was no evidence that it was going to happen. There was no real reason to put his trust in it. But he just lived it out by faith. And everything comes together. And now he brings in a harvest. And in comes the groceries on the table. And by the way, if this didn't happen, he would starve to death. So he works at it. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until he receives the early and late rains, you also be patient. Oh, sure you don't see justice now. Sure you, life doesn't make sense right now. Sure there's inequity in the world. Sure you've watched the news and you see how wicked the world has become. And you're beginning to wonder what's happening with the next generation or how much more we can slide down the hill or how far or deeper can we go into uh, whatever sin we've decided to elevate in our culture and, and claim it as being you know, a wonderful thing. And we can do this and we can do that. And you, you wonder, how long can this go? How far can this go? Well, people, be patient. Because people, you, you, you see them around, you, you think they're getting away with it. Establish your hearts. This means to, be, to make stable. Get in the mindset of the coming of the Lord is at hand. This doesn't mean that it's happening tomorrow, although um, I'm not saying that it couldn't. When he says it's at hand, he is saying that this is the next event on God's agenda. The next event on God's great scheme of his plan for life, for this universe. His great scheme, the next big thing on his agenda is to come in judgment. And to come and to make the books right. Now there's details about this which we'll not get into. And of course, we spend some time in eschatology. And you know, I'm a little quirky in some of the things that I like to say about that. So we'll stay off the subject so I don't get any tomatoes thrown at me. But you understand, this is what his, his premise is. Wait for the coming of the Lord. He throws this in, which is almost an aside. Do not grumble against one another. He's been telling us to guard our tongues the whole way through the book. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, again, he reminds us, the judge is standing at the door. Do you ever have that moment in, um, in grade school, maybe, where you're the kid who's, um, I'm not talking about myself now, but fooling around in class, you know, and there, there's somebody that's doing something they shouldn't do, maybe hopping from one desk to the next or whatever's going on, and all of a sudden, with, unbeknownst to them, <coughs> they hear this little... <coughs> And the teacher has walked into the room and they had no idea that the teacher was there. And if they had known that the teacher was coming down the hall and right there, and that's the child that figures out, you stand at the door and watch and let me know when the teacher's coming. Why do we do that? Because we behave accordingly when we know that the judge is standing at the door. So watch your mouth, people. Be careful how you behave, people. Understand, people, that your life is being judged, that your life is being watched, don't grumble against one another. Watch your tongue. Watch how you get along. I know that things are falling apart in the world. Don't take it out on each other, is what he's saying. Don't be hard on each other. Don't grumble, because the judge is standing again at the door. Against this, again, the sense of imminence, of the judgment of the Lord. Verse 10. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Now, I know that this is a little bit challenging to speak to uh, people regarding suffering when we live in uh, rather palatial uh, homes and, and, you know, situations and we can turn on the air conditioning and we can, you know, do whatever we need to do to be comfortable. But at any rate, if you know anything about what it is to wish for justice, Paul, uh, James is talking to you. He's talking now to, to look at the prophets. Take the prophets as an example. I mean, let's just think, consider for a second a few of these prophets. Think about Moses. Did he have a good time? 
They wanted to put Moses to death. How many times was he in the wilderness and they decided that this man should not be our leader? That we should go back where we came from and I think we should put this man to death. That's exactly what they did with the next leader. Along comes Joshua. If you ever read Numbers 13, 14, they pick up stones, decide it's time to kill Joshua. Why? Just because he wanted to do what God wanted to do. What happened to David? David was chased like a partridge in an animal through the woods, through the hills of, uh, of, the, of the area. Why? Why? Because he wanted to do what the Lord wanted to do. Because he was right. Because God's hand was on him. And his enemies were against him. Think about Elijah. What had Elijah ever done to deserve that he would be hunted? And that if Ahab had found him, he would be killed. And the king was chasing him down. He had to go and live in the middle of nowhere, in the wilderness. He lived by a, a brook and drank the water until it dried up. He had no food. Birds came and brought him food. And if the Lord hadn't supplied it, he would have died. What kind of a life is this? Why did he suffer like this? Why? Because he knew there was a God who was in control of it all, and one day there would be justice. What about Jeremiah? Wrote the Bible. What, did he, what was happened to it? It was torn out. Baruch had a snatch from him, and it was thrown into the fire. Jeremiah himself was thrown into a pit, uh, sunk down into, you've read it I'm sure, sunk down into the pit, up to his armpits in the mud, couldn't get out of the cistern. Why? Because he was serving the Lord. Think about Daniel. Did he have a good time? Did not have a good time. You might remember the struggles that he knew under Nebuchadnezzar and Darius. He ended up in a lion's den. I don't need to tell you the story because you've been in Sunday school two weeks in a row. What about John the Baptist? How did he fare? Did he do a good thing? What did he ever do wrong? What happened to him? lost his head. Why? Because he said, you have somebody else's wife. Oh, and that for that, he ends up in prison and he ends up losing his head just because, why? He was serving the Lord. What kind of justice is that? Did they get away with it? Yes, they got away with it. What about Jesus? Do I need to tell you that he suffered injustice? Do I even need to begin to tell you that absolutely his whole life was about injustice? The way they treated him, the way they mocked him, the way they scorned him, the way they nailed him to a cross? What about Paul? What did he do? He just went in and preached the gospel. They stoned him to death and tried to kill him how many times? And he was in shipwreck and all that went on and all the injustice of his life. Did everybody get away with it? Yeah. Did anything bad happen? Of course. What was his reaction? Serve the Lord and every one of the apostles and every one of us in the, in the New Testament church. We are facing the very same potential persecution just for doing what is right. And we are being ostracized and our culture is against us and all that's going on and we're all about boo-hoo, boo-hooing for us. Church, He's saying, chin up. Do you understand? This is how it goes for us. This is normal for the church. But do you understand that one day, all the justice, the injustice of the world be righted? Behold, he says, look at these, those who suffered. We consider these people to be heroes. We consider them blessed to remain steadfast. We hold them up as examples. We look at these people and we say, that's how it's done. Well, he's saying to you, this is what you're going to have to do too. People, we are living in a time with injustice where nothing seems to make sense at times and we are being uh, uh, admonished to just be patient until the Lord returns. And when he does, the books will be open and all will be made right. We consider blessed those who remain steadfast. I've been watching a bit of the Olympics here and there. When I've had time, I haven't seen a lot of it, but you know, we like to hear these stories about the Olympians, don't you? Uh, know these stories of these people who have just gone through such real hardships, and their life was this, and they had this problem, and this problem, and this family issue, and that thing, and then, guess what? They finally made it to the Olympics, and then, because they're Canadian, of course, they don't make very good anyways. They, um, we try to think it's a, make it a big deal out of a bronze medal. Yeah, they got bronze! Yeah, right, okay. So that's just because we're Canadians. We think it's a big deal to come in third. Um, it's not. Why do we hold these people up? Why do we look at their lives and their examples and, and are encouraged by them? Why? Because they have been steadfast. They've been pushing on in the midst of hard times. And this is all that James is saying. You've heard the steadfastness of Job. You know the story of Job. If you've never read the book of Job, it's your homework for the day. It doesn't take you that long. It's only about 41 chapters or so. It should take you an hour, give or take. Job had everything. Look at the steadfastness of Job, he says. Job had everything. He had a great life. What happened to him? It was all taken away. He ended up with uh, an illness, boils and all the like. What happened to his friends? His friends came along and told him, Job, the reason you're like this is because you have sinned. It's clear. God is right. God is just. God is perfect. If this has happened to you, it's because there's something wrong in your life. What did, J what did Job say? 
Job said, no, that's not the case. I'm telling you, I am suffering injustice. They're saying, no, 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 this is not injustice. This is justice. And one friend after another friend tried to make their case, tried to make their case against God and against Job, putting Job down. And all the while, Job dug in his heels. No, 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 no. I don't have an answer for this. But I can tell you this. If I could talk to God, I could make my case, and I would show you that this has been injustice. I have done nothing wrong. I am suffering for no purpose. And of course, his wife, his wonderful wife, that God gave him, blessed creature that she was, curse God and die. He doesn't. He hangs in there. He hangs in there all the way to the end of the book. And what does he do? He finally gets to stand before God and have a conversation with God, if you will. And what happens? Job realizes, God, you're in control. You can do whatever you want. I wasn't there when you did all these things in creation. Who am I to think that you were in unjust to me? I have every right to be unhappy for my circumstance, but blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. I am in no position to complain. You do whatever you want. You are always right. You are always just. You are always perfect. And even when to my eyes it looks wrong, you're right. You have seen the purposes of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. He's not a vengeful God. He doesn't bring calamity on us just for his own entertainment. He's not being cruel to us. And what is James saying? Hang in there above all brothers. Be patient and wait for the coming of the Lord when all things will make sense. So he finishes the text with this very, seems almost different subject, verse 12. Above all my brothers... Do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. Let your yes be yes, your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. What? What does this have to do with what we've just been talking about? All of a sudden, be patient and troubles and trials and, and the prophets and all these examples and Job and hang in there and God will bring justice and by the way, make sure you tell the truth. What? What, what is he? I've whiplash from that sudden change in direction. What is he doing? Do you know what he's talking about? because you did this as a child. I don't know if you remember this from um, this little film, the Pixar film, this little scene. Swear you'll take us cross your heart. Remember this from Up? If you haven't seen it, you need to. Cross it, cross your heart. Good, you promised, no backing out. Remember that as a kid? Cross my heart, hope to die. How does it end? Why do we, where do we get up this stuff? Stick a needle in, what? Who's doing this? What are we saying? We do this because why? Because we know that people are not trustworthy. We know that they lie. We know that they're deceitful. And so we come up with something that you have to do to yourself that is horrific so that if you back out, you have to take a needle and stick it in your own eyeball. That'll keep you from telling a lie. Yeah, that should work. So we come up with, on a human level, all these ways of emphasizing that we're going to tell the truth. I swear on a stack of Bibles. Maybe you don't say that, but I've heard that. I swear on my mother's grave it's true. Why do we have to make these kind of oaths like this? Well, these are, this is exactly what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. People in Jesus' day were making all kinds of oaths. Oaths on top of oaths. I swear by the gold that's on top of the temple. And Jesus was saying, what, what good is that? It has nothing to do with swearing an oath like that. That's not going to make you tell the truth. It's not going to change who you are. In fact, look at these words that I've highlighted. These are almost word for word what James has just said to us in James chapter 5. This is from Matthew 5, 34, Jesus' words. Do not take an oath, either by heaven or by the earth. Do not take an oath. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Clearly, Jesus said more than that. But what James said is exactly what Jesus said. Listen, let me try to explain why this is in there and what this is about. He's not saying when you go into court it's wrong to swear on the Bible that you're going to tell the truth. It's not wrong to tell somebody that you're going to tell the truth and swear an oath to be a police officer or whatever you have to do or swear an oath into office. That's not what this is. This is not saying that's wrong. What he's saying is you are now in the midst of trial. You are in the midst of calamity. You are going through all kinds of hardship and just like the seed that was sown in the parable that Jesus told, some of it's going to fall into rocky places. The thorns will come up and begin to choke it out. And you will prove that your yes for the Lord becomes a no. 
that the word, world and the circumstances are going to squeeze you out, that ultimately what you said you were going to follow, that you said you were committed, that you said you were on your way with Christ, suddenly you have allowed these circumstances and situations that you see around you, the injustice in the world, the fact that God seems to be sitting back and not letting doing anything and evil is having its time, now I'm a no. That's what he's saying. Above all else, brothers, do not let the circumstances of the wickedness of this world squeeze out what you have committed to in Christ. Do not swear either by heaven or by the earth or by any other oath. Let your yes be yes. Let your word be golden. If you're committed to Christ, you're committed to Christ. Be patiently living your life, waiting for the day, the day of the Lord's return when all the injustice will be made right because this is a faith that works. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for this text. We just pray you'd make it alive to our hearts, that we would live it out as we commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen.